our ethnic ID. Um, my my great grandparents were old order Amish, and they left the faith, and so we sometimes think of ourselves, the prize, as jerked over Amish, and so the <laughs> ethnic ID <laughs> sometimes uh, has a bearing. For a lot of men, especially, uh, our identity is tied up in our occupation. Before we left for Africa, I was a registered landscape architect. Okay, and that was that was who I was. For some of us, it's an illness. Uh, for for a while, I, I had some severe cardiac issues, had open heart surgery, and so I was a cardiac survivor. That was my identity. Sometimes it's a tragedy in your life becomes your defining moment. And uh, when our eldest son was killed, I, I was a grieving parent for many, many years. That was my ID. Uh, for some people in this day and age, their sexual orientation is right in everybody's face. And Jesus help us, we don't want to hear about it. Uh, for some of us, it's our faith. Uh, we're Christian, we're Muslim, we're Buddhist, whatever. Uh, but, but who do you think you are? Where do you, where do you get your identity from? Now, in the African context, identity is far more important for them than it is for us. Uh, and the family is everything. Relationships are far more valuable than any work that might get accomplished. Relationships are everything. But there are several layers of identity that the African people rely on. The first one is being African, being born on the continent. That is important. Then you're part of a tribe. You're part of the Shona, the Ndebele, the Tonga. Uh, the Bantu, there's just all kinds of different tribes. We work primarily with the Shona tribe. That's a layer of identity. And within the tribe, then you have clans and totems. And a totem is usually an African animal. The crocodile totem is far stronger than the monkey totem. And so there's a hierarchy there. And when it comes time to marry, you never marry inside your totem. Okay, so there's no um, interbreeding there. The family unit is of ultimate importance. Um, Multiple generations is what the, the Africans always look at. Uh, if you ask an African, how is your family, it's everyone who's living and the generation that has just died. It always includes aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, it's everybody. And I want you to think for a moment about your warmest memories of Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or any of those kinds of things. Multiply that by 20. That's where the Africans live every day. Okay. Now imagine now that you're an orphan. You've lost most of these layers of identity. Your sense of, your sense of family is lost. Your identity is lost. One of the worst things that could happen to a human being in the African way of thinking is to become an orphan. Okay? It's a terrible thing. Next slide, please. Well, today we want to get a grip on who we are in the kingdom. And we don't want to miss out on this. This is... Um, Something we've camped out on uh, for the last couple of years with, with our Shona brothers and sisters because we found that it's absolutely essential for them to understand who they are in Christ, how everything changes when they come to Christ. And Ephesians 1 is just a brilliant passage of scripture to give us a lot of these identifiers. I'll be reading from verse 3 through verse 14, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he's poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved Son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his Son, and our sins are forgiven. He showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure, and this is his plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us from the beginning, and all things happened just as he decided long ago. God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. And now you have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saved you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything he promised, 
and that he has purchased us to be his own people. This is just one more reason to praise our glorious God. I love this passage of scripture because it's just so rich with so many identifiers. First, we're told that we're blessed. And I'm not going to reread these scriptures. They're on the screen for you behind me. So who's doing the blessing? It's the Father. And what is the blessing? It says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. It's endless. It's beneficial in every way. It's uncorrupted. Why? Because we belong to Christ. If Jesus' work is really finished, we're the most blessed people who've ever lived on the planet, aren't we? Next, we're loved. Even before he made the world, God loved us. Now that's something to really think about. Even before the creation happened, he had you in mind. And he loved you. Father's affection for you has no boundaries whatsoever. There's nothing holding back his affection. Now how many of us had fathers who did not and could not love us? Anybody? I'm definitely in that camp. How many of you heard over and over again as children, you are never going to amount to anything? That was a thousand times, over and over. The problem with growing up in a family that's dysfunctional is that you have that same picture of Father God that you have for your biological father. And let's face it, our, our biological fathers made some mistakes, didn't they? Our, our Heavenly Father is not quite like that. And that's what we want to explore today. Now, some of us picture God as having a big fly swatter, and He's just waiting for you to make that mistake. Anybody see him like that? I saw that. <laughs> we don't do things that way. How many times do I have to tell you? We just have this vision that God has this big fly swatter. He's going to smack us good when we make a mistake. And that's somehow, sometimes the way we see him. Now on the other side of that, some of us really wish that we had a two-inch God on a leash. Stay. Come over here and bless me. You know you want to do it. Come. Bless me. Okay, go back to your corner and that's it. I'll let you know when I need you. Well, that's a terrible way to look at God, isn't it? Father God is not like that. He's entirely positive. He's beneficial. He's nurturing. He's edifying. It's all good. Everything he does is for good. It's for our own good. It's always for your good. Always for good. Next, we're chosen. Again, even before he made the world, he chose you. He's mine. She's mine. You just went through. You, you were chosen. That's the one I want. But what have we been chosen for? We've been chosen to be holy. Now, how many of you picture holy as perfect? It's holy perfect? What we're praying it isn't, right? Holy is being set aside for a special purpose. That, that's the Hebrew understanding. To so be set apart or complete. And the scripture tells us we're without fault in Father's eyes. I want him to see me without fault. I don't know about you, but I want to be seen without fault. We're so used to hearing that little voice in our head, sometimes it's even our voice, that says, you can't be God's child, look what you did. His people don't do things like that. How could you do that? You, you're not his child, you can't be his child. We have to remember that it's the devil's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. His job is to destroy you. The evil one uses our own voice sometimes inside our heads to rob us of the free truth that we are chosen, we are without fault in our Father's eyes, he tries to kill our faith, destroy our identity. And Scripture says, resist him and he will flee. Okay? The idea is resist. Next, we're adopted. And the scripture says it's an unchanging plan. What, where would we be if God changed his mind all the time? We wouldn't know where we stood. But it's an unchanging plan. Father didn't change his mind when we sinned. He didn't cancel the adoption. And the adoption means you have full rights as a biological child. Okay? Full inheritance. This is good news. We're brought to the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the way. It's Jesus that brought us home. And the other part of this verse I really love is that this gave Father God great pleasure. Okay? It wasn't an obligation. It wasn't done under stress or duress. He has a great sense of delight and pleasure. He couldn't wait to adopt you. Next, we're pitied or mercy. And uh, I, the Greek word here, every translation does this one a little differently. 
The verb form, or the noun form, I should say, is charis. It means graciousness, benefit, favor, uh, a gift, or grace. It's to give that to, the, to someone. And then the verb form is caritao. It means to grace, to induce special honor, to make accepted, to make someone highly favored. Okay? So when you see wonderful kindness in this passage, that, those are the words that are being used. So let's look at how, how Father is doing this. Wonderful kindness says that he's poured it out on us. Now think about that. Is he giving us grace with an eyedropper? Oh, here's a drop. If you're good in 20 years, I'll give you another one. No, it says he has poured out grace. Forget the fly sweater, God. He's poured out grace. We're drowning in grace. We're covered in grace. His grace is in abundance. We're graced because we belong to the Father's dearly loved Son. Now, being rich in kindness means he's purchased our freedom and our sins are forgiven. There's no bankruptcy with the Father. He's rich in every way. Father's never stingy, lacking, or cheap. He's always generous, giving to us in a lavish kind of way. He showered us with kindness and grace, along with wisdom and understanding. Okay? We're well covered. Next, we belong. As human beings, we want to belong. We want to be loved. We want our lives to have meaning. Now, our orphans are desperate to belong. You know, they're missing these, these layers of identity. The community tells them, you don't belong, you're a waste of resources, you do not deserve to be fed, let alone educated, uh, you just, you're a waste. You know, you should be the slaves of, of distant relatives, that's all that life should be for you. That's what you deserve, because you're an orphan. And the, the word orphan uh, is almost used like a swear word. It's one of the worst things you could call someone is you know, But we tell the kids, Eden is your family. You do have a family. You are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Orphan is not your identity. Okay? They have to understand that. Now, some of us were told uh, as children that we do not belong. We're not good enough to belong. We're too messed up to belong to the family. Too big, <coughs> too big a disappointment to belong. Too screwed up to belong. We're emotionally amputated, and that hurts. But we still have that need to belong. We're wired for that. And Father God says, you belong. Next, we're purchased. Now, you know, God really has a sense of humor because, uh, and some of you I know go to this guy, our, our dentist in Goshen is Bob Barker. Okay, let's make a deal. Okay? Someone referred us to a dentist in Spindale, North Carolina, and his name is Michael Jackson. <laughs> and I thought, you can't make this stuff up. It's just too quirky. <laughs> How, what are the odds, you know? Well, I, I had a, a, fillet, a piece of tooth that came out, and I, I went to see uh, Dr. Jackson. And uh, he said, I'm going to give you an injection. It'll take 15 minutes for it to actually numb your jaw, and then I'll, I'll get busy. But he said, I'm going to give you a test. And I thought, great. <laughs> but he said, what does the word Lord mean? And so I gave him all the Sunday school answers. Nope, nope, that's not it. So I gave him the Bible college answers. And I said, nope. No, you're wrong. That's not it. I thought, man, you've done my brain, not my jaw. <laughs> and finally he said, uh, well, what does the word landlord mean? I said, well, landlord's an owner. He said, exactly. Jesus owns us. And, you know, in our, in our culture, being owned is not politically correct, is it? We don't want to be owned. But the truth is, being owned, we've been bought out of the biggest mess on the planet, and we're owned... So that we're in a safe place. It's good to be known. We're set free in God's ownership. The purchase price was unthinkable. What Jesus went through was unthinkable, but Jesus was willing. And so we are owned, and it's a good thing. Next, we're saved. We've been rescued. We've been saved. We've been delivered. It's from the Greek word soteria. You've been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. You've been rescued from a false identity. You've been rescued from hopelessness and despair, and you've been rescued from yourself. Some of us are our own worst enemies, aren't we? You've been rescued from slavery and brought into freedom. Rescued from slavery, brought into freedom. We don't want to miss that. Next, we're guaranteed. Now, if I spend $2,500 on a computer, I want to guarantee if there's something wrong with that thing, that it's going to get fixed, because that's way more than I want to spend for anything. Um, we like that, but what this verse is talking about is far bigger, 
okay? We carry the king's seal. We are marked as his, almost like branded. The guarantee is unchangeable, it's irreplaceable, it's unrelenting, it's holy, holy, encompassing every part of our being. This guarantee is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. Jesus described the Holy Spirit as another Jesus. And the significant thing is, is, it's not Jesus beside me, it's Jesus inside me. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. This is significant because this other Jesus is inside us, no one can take him away from us. No one can diminish his presence in us. With God inside us, we're invincible. And the proof of that is what's happened in Zimbabwe over 19 years. I mean, God took two of the biggest booger heads on the planet, planted them in a very remote part of Zimbabwe, and then amazing things happen because God is God. You're guaranteed. Next, we're treasured. Why in the world has Father purchased us? It's not that he just tolerated us. He wasn't complacent in helping us because we're pathetic. He values us because we are his treasured possession. The am segula is the, in Hebrew. We're valued beyond our wildest imagination. And it's hard to wrap our heads around that. I want to be valued. I long to be valued. We all want to be valued. Well, we are treasured. God is telling us that. That's one more reason to praise our glorious God. Awesome stuff. I want to borrow a verse from uh, the second chapter of Ephesians. For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Ephesians 2.10. I've always loved this verse. How many of you feel like you're a masterpiece? Okay, how many of you feel like you're a piece of work like my friend in New Jersey always said? Okay, now, now you can raise your hand, okay? Think about this. A masterpiece is not a haphazard effort using the junk out of a dumpster. A masterpiece takes the very best materials, uses all the, creative, all the creativity of the creator to create something that will never be duplicated. You know, you look at some of the stuff, some of the sculptures that uh, Michelangelo did, the Pieta and David and all those, they're, they're unbelievable. But what God has done is even more unbelievable. You, there's nobody like you. There's no one who will ever be born like you. You are completely unique. And we have to recognize that we are a masterpiece. We don't feel like it, though, do we? But we are a masterpiece. But what we want to do today, we want to embrace our true identity. We want to throw off the false identities, the, the different labels we give ourselves. We want to take on our true identity in Christ. And we want to take on our kingdom roles. Yeah. Father God is so good. <laughs> He's even better than you think. That's actually a book title. But we want us to think about this. God did not have to help us, but he did. He did not have to save us, but he did. Everything he does is for our good and for our benefit. Forget the fly swatter God. He doesn't exist. And forget the two-inch God on a leash. We should be ashamed of ourselves for even thinking that way. Our Father's amazing. Now, Bill Johnson's written a book pretty much by this title, and I don't agree with all of Bill's theology, but he has a couple ideas in his book that, I, that make me think. <coughs> the first one is, God loves to hide things, not from us, but for us, because he takes great delight in our sense of discovery as we discover who he is, how good he is, his graciousness, everything about him, uh, think of, you know, like hiding Easter eggs for, for kids. You hide them differently for a two-year-old than you would for a 12-year-old. He hides things from us, not from us, but for us, because he loves our sense of discovery. Another idea that you can chew on for a long time is it will take every minute of eternity to discover all the good things that God has created specifically for you. Every minute of eternity. Now, there's something to think about. Our God is so good. Another thing that we forget is that Jesus has done the heavy lifting. Some of us live our lives like we're trying to, do, trying to earn our salvation. The truth is we could never have saved ourselves. When we're lost in sin, we're pathetically helpless to be true. But Jesus, Jesus Christ found a way to bring us home forever. His blood paid a ransom. His resurrection secured our rescue. The Holy Spirit guarantees our safe arrival home. 
Everything has been done. Jesus' work really is finished. The abundant eternal life he's promised starts today. And I hope you're not one of those people treading water thinking, you know, if I can just hold on until I die, I'll be all better. You know, then all, then all the good stuff's going to happen, you know. It's, that's, not, that's not what Jesus has for you at all. His favor and his blessing has already started. It's already begun. Then what does this, what does this mean today? What does it mean to us if we are truly blessed loved, chosen, adopted, graced, we belong, we're saved, we're sealed in the Holy Spirit, we're treasured, and we're a masterpiece. What does that mean? It means we need to live a life worthy of our destiny. Now the beauty of the book of Ephesians is the first part of the book tells us who we are in the kingdom, gives us our identity. The latter part of the book tells us how to live up to that identity. And we want to lead a life worthy of our destiny. We want to be Christ's spotless bride. And Paul tells us how to do that. We need to focus on the idea that we're going to be citizens of a heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. Well, let's act like it. Let's, let's follow Jesus' example. Let's bring people into the kingdom of light. Let's enjoy and revel in our, in our citizenship in this new city. Now, if you look at... Uh, the description of the book of Revelation of what this city is all about is kind of mind-boggling. 1,600 miles by 1,600 miles by 1,600 miles. Huge. Streets of transparent gold, walls stacked with gemstones, gates that are single pearls 210 feet in diameter. It's, beauti it's beautiful on a scale that we can't even imagine. And that's where that's going to be home. It kind of changes things when we think about it. We need to remember that eternity is going to be wonderful. How many of you think you're going to be strumming a heart floating around on a cloud board out of your skull? Please don't. Please don't. We're going to live life on a grand scale. It'll be a hundred thousand times better than anything we can imagine. No pain, no tears, no sorrow, no bad people, no, no bad things. We'll have joy that's inexpressible. We'll have the greatest family reunion in the history of the universe. We we'll have un uninhibited and unrestricted worship of our King. It'll be overwhelmingly wonderful and good. Everything will be restored to God's eternal design. It's going to be good on a scale we can't imagine. I think one of the things we always have trouble with when we think about all these good things that God has just told us who we are in the kingdom is that we remember all the things that we've done that messed it all up. And the truth is, what Jesus has done for us is too good to be true. But my friends, that's the beauty of it. It is too good to be true. But it's exactly what he wants for every person in this room. The kingdom is an amazing kingdom. And if you don't, if you don't know my Father and you don't know my Jesus, you don't want to miss out on this. Now, I'm going to be here shooting off to Africa in a couple weeks, but I know this church family will take care of anybody who comes through. They're going to raise you up in the faith. They're going to teach you. When you accept Jesus, they're going to help you along. They're going to mentor you. They're going to bring you along. You're going to mature in the faith and be a giant in the kingdom. And we're going to sing an invitation to him, I think. And uh, if you feel like you don't know who Jesus is and you need... You, you want in on this identity, then please go forward. But don't, don't miss out. It's an amazing kingdom. We are very blessed people. And we want to thank you today in person for all the help you've given us in, in starting Eden and keeping Eden going. The impact has been huge over tens of thousands of people. And we couldn't have done it without your help. And God has blessed all of us. This has been a tremendous privilege. To be a part of it, it's been a tremendous privilege uh, for all of us to be a part of it. And uh, we want to say thank you. God bless you.